but yes, Black Birders Week was also a way for us to, um, I guess, find our community because we know Black folks enjoy recreation. We just wanted to be able to facilitate, like make a bridge for those connections to happen. And now people have been able to find people in their communities that they're able to do outdoor recreation with. And that definitely helps people feel more comfortable in what they want to do. But it also encourages people who want to start becoming outdoor enthusiasts to, you know, get, 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 get into it and and try to um, push themselves a little bit further. Welcome to another episode of Animalia, where we bring wildlife conservation, climate change, and social justice together to help people connect the dots and get involved. Today on Animalia, we are here with Danielle and Chelsea, who are both members of Black AF and STEM and co-founders of Black Birders Week. Danielle and Chelsea, thanks for joining today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you so much for having us on. Since blackbirding is kind of woven through so much of what you do and the things we're going to talk about. I wanted to start by just asking you both what blackbirding represents to you. Sure. I'll go ahead and take a stab at it. Um, so blackbirding, I mean, it's, it's basically birding, but I guess as a black person, um, we have some other things that we have to think about um, aside from like, I guess, non-black people when you go out into nature Um, usually the perceptions that other people have of us um, and how we can best stay safe in case, you know, some situation goes awry. Um, But as far as like black birding, it's just a recreation. It's, it's a way for me to be able to um, just have a nice de-stressing moment. And it's a nice way for me to connect with nature. Yeah. I'm going to have to agree with Danielle. Um, It is a lot about connecting with nature and, um, for for me, it's important that people know that Black people also do activities like that. Because um, one of the, the things that people tend to say is that, oh, Black people don't like going birding. There aren't any people, Black people who go birding. And we do. And um, it's the same experience for us that it would be for anybody else. And um, going outside and being able to, to bird watch and have that moment in nature is it's really important to me it's really grounding i want to pause and let you know about animalia's latest limited run collaboration which we did with black af and stem it's an awesome long sleeve tee perfect for the fall to celebrate black birders week 65 percent of proceeds from this tee are going to black af and stem so you're supporting a great cause while rocking a great tee which comes in both heather gray and indigo blue the tees were designed by chelsea connor Black AF and STEM. So let's hear her talk about them. Um, yeah. So uh, for the, the shirt to commemorate Black Birders Week, um, we did a design with three black birds on the front of the shirt and um, hashtag BAFIS, which is Black AF in STEM. Um, and there are some black feathers uh, down the sleeve as well. And on the back of the shirt, it's just um, a quick fact about blackbirds and how um, amazing they are to look at. Um, we recognize that not just blackbird is black birds as well themselves are um, discriminated against compared to um, other birds with lighter colors or more vibrant colors. Um, what in fact blackbirds are just as interesting and amazing as they are if not more in some cases um, so we definitely wanted to to highlight that um, in addition to like making that connection to black birders so that's what um, we hope that this shirt is going to um, commemorate and and put out there and uh, really hope that you like it the teas are available at www dot i love animalia.com that's www dot i l o v e a n i m a l i a dot com just open the shop tab and find the black f and stem animalia collab all podcast listeners get 10 percent off just use the code podcast that's p-o-d-c-a-s-t in the checkout 
Now, back to our show. So what stage did you both fall in love with the outdoors? What, what stage in life? How old? If any, if you can remember that. So I fell in love with the outdoors. I mean, it was pretty innate. Like it's, it's a day one type of thing for me. Um, my parents were telling me that, you know, I was like a two year old. I was picking up like the bugs in the house and taking them outside for everybody and catching lizards. And um, so it, it's been instilled in me. I don't know. I just have always been that person. For me, it's like I'm, I'm um, from the Commonwealth of Dominica. That's in the an island in the Caribbean. And um, growing up there, uh, like we have such an amazing range of flora and fauna. Um, like just growing up, seeing everything around me, I've just always been interested in it. Um, like we'd find snakes. Um, one of my neighbors had killed a snake, and I like I was like, I want to see what it looks like, so I'm gonna go over there and touch it. <laughs> so just I've just always been the one to to have that curiosity. Hearing you both say that, you know, it's a great reminder of how similar we all are. I think it was you, Chelsea, that said this at the top, um, but that we all have this capacity for an equal form of love, of nature, of the outdoors, of the natural world. Uh, it's where we all stem from. What was it about your family or your upbringing that instilled or in, incited or was a catalyst for that love of nature? You know, was it a particular parent or other family member or sibling? Um, none of the above. Just curious. As far as my immediate family, um, none of them have like the same connection to nature that I do, but I definitely was facilitated by my grandparents. They have about like a 13, 14 acre farm. And I would spend a lot of the summers out there, like helping them out and also exploring. So um, a lot of my love and understanding and desire to understand um, what's going on in nature comes from spending time with my grandparents. For me, like my brother, um, well, my entire family, like always encouraged my curiosity, um, but also like my brother and I would ha have like a lot of questions about things. I'd find cool things and I'd like come back and be like, hey, look at what I found. Um, or like he'd help me figure out what the names of things are um, wh when I was still like learning how to, to search for things up myself. So kind of kind of um, someone right beside me um, asking a lot of the same questions that I did. I want to ask you both what your sort of favorite routine experiences in nature. Uh, let me give an example for myself that kind of helps color that a little bit. Um, so I love you know, when I'm hiking, camping, uh, especially dispersed camping, uh, stumbling across, you know, a creek or some fresh running water that's drinkable and sort of filling up in my canteen and just having that like pure natural water, unique to that place I'm in. It feels like you can al almost taste, you know, the forest, the land um, that you're uh, experiencing. And it's a repeatable experience that I can always relive time and time again. And I'm just curious, like what, you know, what that equivalent is for, for you both. And, and, you know, what's the one thing that kind of stands out in your mind about your, your love of outdoor experiences? I really love the feeling of being in the Texas Hill country. Cause that's where I grew up and seeing like these limestone structures and these trees that are barely hanging on to like the sides of these canyon walls and these nice gently rolling hills. And it's, it's just a really ni nice thing to be able to see over the tops of pretty much, and it's such an expansive area and you can see it's, it, it literally is like a Georgia O'Keeffe painting and the clouds are really picturesque and you can see their shadows on the landscape and there's sunlight shining through it and the trees are always green. And that's, that's just a, a moment for me that just really ties it all together. And it's just like, Oh, this is just such an amazing place to be and such an amazing feeling to have to be able to enjoy nature like this. I like, uh, there's a trail that I like doing back home goes up into, uh, well, it's the, the trail starts off in cloud forest, but you do go up a bit higher into it. Um, you get a really good view of the lake. So getting to the top and getting the, the view of that lake um, or just doing like um, a regular hike uh, that has a river 
uh, somewhere along the path and getting to, to stop and like put my feet in or just like sit next to it. So there's been such a long standing systemic problem with racism in this country that hopefully is painfully obvious um, to everybody at this point. But I want to, for our listeners to talk specifically about the outdoor space and and help people understand the unique challenges. Well, some are unique like to the outdoor space. Some are, you know, uh, repetitive of the the discrimination and racism black people feel in other, other parts of, of day-to-day life. But it's talking specifically about the outdoor space um, and, you know, what those different challenges are. You know, on one hand, we have the issue that black people are just too often not made to feel welcome. They're looked at with suspicion as intruders in public lands. And, you know, this is very similar to police looking at black people first as suspects or a convenience store clerk looking at a black person, you know, uh, if, you know, look for a shoplifting crime they didn't yet commit. Um, so that that's one of the things that, you know, definitely stands out. I think there's another issue around just the fact that a lot of outdoor activities, um, experiences, products are marketed primarily to white Americans. Um, you know, from what I can tell, a lot of the the big brands and, you know, commercials out there are are marketing to one aspect of society. Um, and then and that that seems pretty obvious. Then then there's the issue of space segregation, the fact that, you know, a lot of the black community in this country has been pushed into, you know, dense urban areas um, where there's not as much nature accessible. And, you know, of course, not everyone is dealing with that, but uh, that's more common um, for black Americans than it is for for white Americans. Um, So just, you know, getting out in nature and discovering nature just requires more work. There's also, I think, a factor of a lack of access to property ownership and land governance. And then the other one that stands out to me is sort of the lack of visibility of of role models in this space. Yeah, that list is definitely a good start. And then another couple things that I want to add on to it is um, I, I, experience of colorism. Um, some people might avoid being in the sun for extended periods of time because they become darker and there's things associated with that as well. Um, So that that's a limit for people to want to enjoy the outdoor recreation. And I guess more of a a deeper idea is um, diagnoses of like if a tick bite happens and you have a, a mark on you that looks like you got bit by a tick and you're not sure if you have like potential Lyme disease or something. A lot of dark skin has not been photographed with those symptoms. So um, that's that's pretty discouraging, too, that if, you know, something happens to us in the outdoors, we might not be treated the best way that we can or believed um, when we're trying to tell what, what has happened. Yeah, I just want to say real quick on Instagram, um, the account Brown Skin Matters has been trying to curate pictures of um, brown skin with different skin conditions or bites. So that um, we'll, we'll be better able to recognize it when it happens to us. And having things like that is it's super important. Um, and you think that, you know, when you, you Google, like, what does this bite look like? Then, you know, you get an array of different, like, skin colors with X bite on it or whatever skin condition. But no, when you look it up, you get... Um, pictures of like different shades of white skin but not different shades of brown skin and that's that's a really difficult thing to to look at like I had an allergic reaction once and I didn't realize I was having an allergic reaction because I just thought that my arm was itchy and I didn't realize like what hives would look like on my skin um the, the danger the danger goes further than just like um you know, not being able to recognize like a bite or um, a rash or something like that. It's also like people who uh, feel the need to like get into your personal space and ask you, what are you doing out here? Like you don't belong here and they want to know why you feel like you do. 
You know, I'm glad you, I'm so glad you brought up the skin example because, you know, again, like I'm in the process myself, just being totally frank with you both. And we've talked about this of, you know, continuing to learn, to be more aware, to be more inclusive. We all, especially in the white community, should be striving. We should all should consider ourselves in the process. Um, we're all starting from different different points, of course, but we all should strive to do more and more. And so this is a great example for me of something I've never thought about. And, you know, I haven't had to think about it, frankly. Um, and that's a privilege that I have because, yeah, when I look up a tick bite, I get tons of images, thousands of images of examples of what that looks like on my skin. And just for context, like I've actually had Lyme disease in my life. Um, so I have been bit by a deer tick and I was fortunate enough to catch it early on. And in large part, you know, kind of as you're saying, it's because I, you know, was able to to, to do so in an easy way on the internet. So, you know, had, had I not been able to recognize us so quickly, who knows sort of what, you know, what, what would have happened. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great example. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad, uh, I'm glad you mentioned it. And that's a, that's a new, you know, kind of learning thing for me. And that's exactly, you know, why I love having these conversations. Cause I also grow and learn, you know, uh, you know, with it, with everyone. And as you said, Chelsea, as a black person, you know, and you're putting your safety on the line just from the other people that are going to suspect you and sort of assume you're somewhere you shouldn't be. And it's, it's incredibly unfair and it's something, you know, it's something we have, we have to change. And that goes to all of us, um, whether even if we're, you know, not, not acting that way, we see it, you know, we, you know, by not saying something up and not speaking when it is happening, you're, you're enabling it. So it's something we all, we all got to stand up against. So now on the other side of that, I want to, want to ask you both and, and, and please, if, if sharing, anything of this nature is triggering or traumatic at all, we can totally skip it. But in the event you do want to share, I want to give you space to do so. But, um, you know, is there a moment that stands out when you were outdoors in nature, doing some of your conservation work, um, birding, where you were reminded of the color of your skin and you were reminded of, you know, that things are different and, you know, completely unfair way uh, for you. And, you know, maybe you felt marginalized or threatened or unwanted. And, you know, if there's anything that you want to share in that regard, you know, I want to give you the, the space to do so. But again, if no obligation at all, if it's, if it's triggering at all, we can totally skip this, but I just, you know, wanted to ask and, um, and give you the space if you wanted. I'll share a more recent um, experience that I had. It was in, um, I was, I was birding in the botanical gardens um, in San Antonio. Um, I think this was like right before black birders week too. Um, And I saw another group of people birding in the same area that I was. And I was super interested like, Oh, cool. They're birding. I wonder what they're going, what they're looking at, what they're seeing. So I approached this group. I mean, I'm wearing like my bird gear. I have boots on. I have like binoculars that are, I mean, pretty obvious. I have a hat that has a bird on it. I think I'm wearing a shirt that has like owls all over it too. And I walk up to this group. I'm like, hey, um, what are you looking at? I'm really interested in like, you know, possibly what birds you've seen today. And they turn around. They look at me. They look at each other and then they turn back around without saying anything to me at all. I'm just like, this is weird. Like, do they not get it? Like, I'm part, I'm part of the same team. Like, I'm, I'm team bird, just like you. So I like ask them again, and it happens again. They look at me and they're just like, they, the way they're looking at me it seems like they don't want me there. They don't expect me to even be interested in what they're interested in. Um. And eventually some ladies like, oh, we're looking at a gray cat bird. And I'm just like, okay, cool. But by the time they told me what they were looking at, I had completely lost interest and completely was like, I'm going to just do my own thing. I know, <laughs> I know I'll see some better birds. I, I was just trying to be nice and have a conversation with fellow birders. But moments like that, it's just like, what's going on? What's, what's the deal, y'all? I think I caught up with them later on that day and some of the men that were in the group were like questioning me about like the birds I've seen and like trying to make sure I saw what I really saw. And it's just like, all right, y'all, <laughs> I don't, 
I don't need to be here. It's I know birds. I don't have to prove that I know birds. Well, I'm sorry you went through that, Danielle. Um, you know, I can feel from you sharing that story how, you know, marginalized and shunned it, it made you feel in that moment. And, you know, kudos to you for having that inner strength and realization that, you know, they're the ones missing out, honestly, by not engaging with you. And, um, you know, uh, and you have the strength to sort of to realize that, but it doesn't make that moment any less hurtful. Um, and, uh, and, and that those kind of microaggressions, um, are, are, are something that we need to talk about and need to share. So I, I appreciate you doing so. I'm sorry. And I'm sorry you went through that, but I, um, I appreciate you sharing. So let's talk about birding. I actually have a lot of questions about birding just because I've never done it. Um, you know, I think yeah, you both have gotten to know me a little bit uh, in, the, in the course of doing our collab together and my uh, intense love of nature um, and, uh, and non-human life. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I've, I've never, I've never done birding. And, um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm eager to, to, to ask you both, and I'm sure many of our listeners haven't had, haven't had a chance to do it as well. Um, so can you share a little more about birding? You say that you've never gone birding, but you've, you've, you possibly, you know, like inactively birded, which like, that's, that's one of my favorite things about birding is it can happen anywhere and anytime. You don't have to like set a specific side time aside and be like, I'm going birding from three to four. And that's my birding time. And only am I birding then like you can do birding through your window um, while you're driving um, virtually you can watch webcams and bird that way. Like there's so many different ways that people can do birding. And yeah, I think that's really encouraging and really inclusive and exciting. You don't have to be outside. You can do it literally anywhere. Right. <laughs> Um, as far as like some basics, um, again, the fact that it can go anywhere in, in any time, you don't have to like set up a specific time, but if you are that type of person, you know, try to find a green space that's near you. Um, try to find like a quiet area. Yes. Cemeteries are definitely one of my favorite places to go birding, especially now, um, since, you know, parks are often a little more crowded than I feel comfortable being around. Um, so cemeteries, especially the ones that have really nice, big established trees are really, they're basically parks. And in fact, our, our nation's parks were inspired by cemeteries. So, um, just, you know, bring it back, bring it back to the history of the United States and go, go birding in a cemetery. It's a really nice, tranquil, peaceful, super quiet getaway zone to go watching birds. You, You don't have to have binoculars, I would just say bring comfortable clothes, bring a friend, uh, and some water and some snacks. Curious, what's the longest you've gone birding for in terms of consecutive hours? Okay, so I went birding with uh, Jeffrey Ward in, it, it was over a year ago, so it's last May. And we were birding for like eight hours straight, maybe nine, I don't know. And that's not including like travel time. That was just like, we woke up at like five in the morning. And then did not leave until like nighttime. So some serious hours put in. I try not to stay out too long in this Texas heat, but uh, probably like two and a half hours. There's a trail near my um, apartment. There's a stream and everything that um, ducks and egrets like to, to chill at. Um, I just like I can take the trail down to the park and then back to my apartment. So I just kind of like take my time. So I want to segue that into the work you both did with Black Birders Week. And I think we unfortunately need to start for our listeners just to recap the incident that happened in Central Park, because uh, that was an inciting incident um, before creating Black Birders Week, as we'll talk about in a second. But I think it was, I believe it was on May 26th between Christian Cooper and Amy Cooper. And I'm pretty sure everybody's seen the video by now, but if you haven't, basically what happened um, was there was a... Uh, a black birder named uh, Christian Cooper who was birding in Central Park ran into a woman who had her dog off a leash. 
the dog should be on leash. It is park policy. Christian asked her to put the dog on a leash. And she, you know, proceeded to get very, very frustrated and angry um, and proceeded to call the police on him, you know, making it clear to the police multiple times that an African-American was threatening her, even though Christian Cooper was doing nothing, nothing uh, to threaten her whatsoever. Uh, And it was captured on video and it kind of sparked a a lot of discussion. And, you know, from what I understand, that was sort of uh, sparked the launch of Black Birders Week that you both put on. But I want to ask you both two questions about that video and that incident since it's widely known. One is just what, what was your reaction the first time you saw it? And, you know, the, the second is like, what, what was it about that video that you think made it go viral? You know, these are not, this is not a, um, sadly isolated incident. Uh, these types of things happen all the time to black people, even just within the community of black birding as we, as we've been talking about. Um, so I'm curious, like what, you know, what do you think, what, what was it about that video at the timing that made that video go viral? Because this is also just for reference for people in a kind of timeline check a few days before George Floyd's murder. So this, you know, this, this happened just, just before that and was, was getting, you know, getting shared around prior to that. Yeah. I remember during that time, I, I honestly have never watched the video. Um, I, I probably watched like 10 seconds of it and I was like, okay, cool. I get the gist of it. I get what happens. Um, because honestly, it's, it's, it's the reality that, uh, black Americans have faced black people in general have faced, um, for decades. Like we, we are familiar with these types of videos and it's just painful. I I don't want to watch something like that over and over again, because, uh, unfortunately I can see myself in those videos. I can see people that I know in those videos, um, like that event easily could have happened to anybody I know. And it could have happened to me as well. Seeing it, like, it did make me angry, but it was also like, oh, this again, which is also a really, like, draining feeling that I have to be like, oh, this is happening again. It shouldn't be normal. It shouldn't be commonplace enough that I'm like, oh, that again, and that I can, like, piece together what happens before I even see the rest of the video. I'm not really sure why the video picked up so much I guess attention um it might have been attributed to the fact that we were pretty early on in the pandemic still I guess and folks were mm-hmm. still everybody at home watching it right and... um that's that's why I think this also it wasn't graphic true like no nobody had to watch anything graphic happen so everybody could comfortably watch it and be like oh my god this is what happens to to black people that's terrible yeah it was absolutely um as a result of what happened to christian cooper um but it was also a form of protest again for all the other black lives who have either been placed at risk or lost uh because of racism and because of police brutality um we want to remember all those voices all those those folks that have been uh murdered and, and harmed in so many different ways um but yes black birders week was also a way for us to um i guess find our community because we know black folks enjoy recreation we just wanted to be able to facilitate like make a bridge for those connections to happen and now people have been able to find people in their communities that they're able to do outdoor recreation with and that definitely helps people feel more comfortable and what they want to do but it also encourages people who want to start becoming outdoor enthusiasts to you know get 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 into it and and try to um, push themselves a little bit further you know what you both did with that video in that moment you know i think is very deserves a lot of praise and it's very inspirational because what you what you did is you turned it into an opportunity to do something positive um rather than you know dwelling on the negative and you turn that moment into what would become Black Birders Week. And that was just a galvanizing, uh, incredibly positive movement for the Black conservation community, um, the Black natural sciences community, the Black community in general. 
So tell me, you know, a bit more about how Black Birders Week was formed um, and, you know, what those kind of early days were like, you know, going from, you know, this video and this moment in time into what would become, you know, very quickly thereafter, because it was just a matter of days you put this together, uh, Black Birders Week. I believe it was five, correct? Five different theme days, um, uh, five consecutive virtual event days. Is that, is that correct? Um, yes, five formal days. And then we had another day added on the end that was called uh, Because of Black Birders Week. Um, and that was just us sharing our appreciation, but also wanting to learn from the folks that watched and participated into the week what they got out of it. Um, and it was it was really lovely to see it. So um, Yeah, so it's Black in Nature, Post a Bird, Ask a Black Birder, Burning Wild Black, and then Black Women Who Bird. And what did you both learn in, you know, putting this this event, uh, this this social media digital event together, week together, that maybe you you know didn't know beforehand or something that crystallized for you? Uh, just curious what you kind of both took away from it and what was the what was most memorable for you both? As far as memorable, um, definitely black in nature, that first day it still resonates with me. Um, I think it resonates with a lot of people even to this day um, on how important it is to see yourself represented. Um, as far as black and nature, like, again, it's kind of innate for me. A lot of, a lot of my childhood would spit in nature. It's, it's not a new thing for me to get out in nature, but I think it was reassuring for the folks who are not as familiar to go ahead and get out in, into nature too. But the fact that there was like thousands and thousands and thousands of people posting these pictures of themselves gardening or just sitting out on the porch or like, you know, doing a bunch of different things. They were able to be part of this big movement of being black in nature. And again, it, it it's, it's innate, like being black in nature is just like a, a, a normal everyday thing. And everybody, all black people are, are part of this. Yeah. That first day was uh, amazing. Um, like even like I think like into like the fifth day, people were still posting in the hashtag. People still posting the hashtag now, actually. Uh, like to this day, people are still like tagging things black in nature, and you love to see it. <laughs> and then the organization that you both helped uh, form together, the collective Black AF and STEM, did that form before or after Black Birders Week? Yeah, complicated because <laughs> we've had a group chat. But we were never like anything besides just a group chat. But it's a bunch of black scientists in a group me and we just, you know, chat with each other. Um, and that's pretty much where Black Birders Week was talked about and created. Um, and then after we saw like the impact or I guess during Black Birders Week, we saw the impact that was created. We're like, oh, we should <laughs> we should organize. We should like make ourselves like a thing thing. So that's when we went into the steps of uh, Black Ape and STEM, and now we are almost, almost a 501c3. We're getting there. Is Black Birders Week coming back next summer? Absolutely. We have so many big things planned for the coming year, so I hope everybody stays tuned. Um, Hold on to your tail feathers. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to you know, tease out that's coming up for Black Ape and STEM? No. <laughs> I'm bad. I am bad at teasing and I'm just like, Oh, here's the whole thing. <laughs> so no, I, I can't say anything. At now. There's going to be more lizards next year. I'm just going to say that as a lizard person, expect more lizards. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the lack of representation and inclusion for black indigenous people of color in conservation and environmental work just just generally and just ask you both you know what how do we fix that uh, well i think one of the one of the ways you can do that is to um first off invite um us into those spaces and listen to us um it's not enough to just be like okay well we we've done some diversity hires 
there we go. They're in there. No, you need to you need to listen to us, not just to our ideas for how we can take things forward. When we come to you about um things that issues that we're facing, problems we're having with uh, other people being racist or um aggressive to us uh for whatever reason uh when we bring that to you uh help if you see it happening you speak up um it's not enough to just put us in those spaces you need to put us in those spaces and also make sure that we have the resources to succeed and that you're making the space somewhere that we feel safe and welcome to be in yeah that's exactly what i was thinking too chelsea i was thinking listen and also um especially from the invitation standpoint if you have like a big collaboration even just pass that opportunity on to a black indigenous or other person of color so that they can be part of that Uh, because oftentimes the contributions of BIPOC individuals is overlooked and um yeah if if that facilitation can definitely happen or even be part of the partnership with that individual um yeah, invite us into these spaces. There's also the 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 points of view that you haven't considered or even like or would be able to think of because you've never been in those positions. So sometimes people have ideas and they go ahead and put forth things and then you look at it and you go, Well, as a as a black woman, that's not gonna work for me. I don't know what you guys were expecting with this idea. And it's because they didn't have somebody to tell them that. It's because they they were unable to think of it because they didn't have that point of view, they didn't have anybody on their team like that. And you need people on your team like that who would be able to to correct you when you're going wrong. Like um one time someone on on Twitter said that, you know, they're going to give their students letters to say you know why they're coming to campus it's like okay but you didn't think of the optics of your black students reaching for the letter in their car to show to a police officer did you think about that i'm so glad you mentioned that because it's it's so much more than checking that diversity box you know but actually putting black indigenous people of color in decision making seat at the table roles so to speak you know i see a lot of companies and organizations just purely looking at, you know, oh, do we have representation somewhere within the company, you know, or the organization? And, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can if that's, if that's a yes, but it's like, no, no, no. Like, you know, true intersectionality, true inclusion is making sure that representation is there at all kind of rank and file and, and making sure black and indigenous people of color have a, have a say in the actual outcome of, of, of what, you know, of what's going on. So there's a reckoning going on in the industry right now, and, and rightfully so. Um, uh, you know, two organizations recently that have been going through this are the Sierra Club and the National Audubon Society. The Sierra Club was, of course, founded by John Muir, who, um, you know, uh, contributed a ton to exploration and, uh, and you know, the, the natural world, um, but was also incredibly oppressive in his actions and his words. Just said some awful things. Um, and, and racist things uh, that, have been, that have been well well documented um, during his time. And then the National Audubon Society was not founded by John James Audubon, but it was, of course, named in his rem- uh, remembrance to, you know, again, signal the contributions he made to the natural sciences and birding and uh, ornithology in particular. But he was also a slave owner and, uh, you know, benefited from being born into a plantation owner and the privilege uh, that, that, that gave him. Um, and so both organizations are kind of going through changes to reckon with this. Um, I'm curious, do you both think the Sierra club and national Audubon society for what they've announced so far that they're doing, um, you know, do you, do you think it's enough? And in general, would you like to see, you know, uh, organizations that were founded by, you know, white people that practiced, you know, deeply oppressive behavior, um, in the times that, that they were in, um, you know, what, what do you think is the right thing to do? So I definitely think they should be renamed. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think that's something that the indigenous folks that have been saying, um, for, for years now. Um, but yeah, I, I would definitely let them lead that conversation. Um, I feel like they're the ones that are, that have the authority and should be able to name it, whatever they want to be named. Yeah, I'm I'm on a team rename, um, especially for 
these animals um <laughs> it 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 doesn't make sense to keep glorifying people who sure they've had um a lot of, of things that they've contributed to um the natural sciences but you have to also think about the people in, involved in um natural sciences especially now it's becoming a, a diverse field and think about the effect that it has on us to be like okay um all right well I study this bird that is named after a racist and I just have to put up with the fact that they felt like well he 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 um first noticed this bird and we would like to honor him by naming this bird after like how is how can you honor someone who dedicated their life or strongly believed for all of their life that um I didn't deserve humanity I I wasn't equal to him you know I can really understand that Chelsea if the the name of that bird and every time you have to study it and and look at it and recite it triggers that memory and triggers that trauma and those negative feelings. It's, it's terrible. And, and, you know, I don't have a perfect answer to, to, to this in terms of like exactly what we do, you know, exactly what we rename, where, where we draw the line in doing so we definitely should do some of it, but you know, where that line gets drawn. But, um, you know, I, I just hope that we can learn from our past and our mistakes that we've made and the mistakes people have made. And when we study people, like John Muir and John James Audubon, and they they should remain in history, not sort of be canceled out of it in the sense that they should be studied for both what they did, what they contributed and what they did wrong. And those things should get equal kind of weight, um, you know, and, and, you know, we shouldn't just sweep the bad under the rug. Um, you know, we also shouldn't sweep, I think, the contributions under the rug either, but, you know, um, you know, because nobody certainly wants to be remembered for only their worst behavior, but, you know, we, we, we need to talk, we need to, we need to study them and look at them holistically for, for, for what they did. Um, and, you know, for me, if, if that ends up like us renaming organizations, certain species, if that's where the, you know, um, the, the black indigenous people of color community want to take it in conjunction with the broader scientific community, um, you know, I'm certainly fully on board with it. Um, uh, if that, you know, and that, that hopefully there's a the process for doing so. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that, that, you know, I can understand why, why that can be triggering and, and why we really need to rethink about, um, uh, and think about renaming certain things. I want to ask you both about role models for yourselves. Um, during my process and working with you, uh, I've had, you know, uh, the opportunity to learn about two incredible figures in the black birding community, Dr. Drew Lanham, uh, who's a professor at Clemson and a birder and a poet, um, and Carrie James Marshall, who we spoke about earlier this week, and we're going to be profiling on Animalia this week, who is an incredible artist. Um, uh, his recent work was about uh, black and part black or uh, birds of color. And, you know, watching some of his interviews, I, I, I've learned a ton um, I'm curious for you both, um, you know, who are the figures in the black conservation or natural sciences community that stand out to you as role models? For me, I think Betty Reed Soskin is definitely a role model for me. She is one of the oldest um, park rangers in the United States. There's there's a couple people, um, but um, two of the names that like always immediately come to me first would be Roger Oliner Young um and um Arlington James Arlington James is um he's from he's from back home he's a forestry officer he worked um for forestry for several years and he he's the one who uh put together all of the flora and fauna guides that we have available for the island right now um Arlington Young was the first woman African American woman uh to receive a doctorate in zoology so um I would just think about the two of them. Very cool. Uh, if you both don't mind after, uh, you know, just email me the names and I would love to, you know, include their work uh, as a link in the podcast description. So we have a very pivotal election coming up. Um, 
I know we're all on the same side of this one, uh, at least at the, you know, on the presidential level, I, I, I hope, and I, <laughs> I can say with conviction. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what role do you think climate change is playing in the voting decision for black people in this country? Um, and do you think there's a, enough awareness of the intersection of climate justice and social justice or, you know, within the black community, or do you think there's still a lot of work to do in kind of, and connecting those dots? I'll take a look at it from like the perspective of, I guess, the pandemic, because that's absolutely like a result of climate change. We're going to have more of these types of things occurring. Um, So as far as like how black communities have been affected by climate change or by the pandemic, um, it's definitely disproportionate to the the way that other people have been affected, um, how, how white communities have been affected by the pandemic. So I think the fact that we have to vote during this time um, really concerns a lot of folks, and it, it should. Um, we shouldn't have to be putting our lives at risk in order to be able to vote or not vote. Um, and the fact that, you know, mail-in ballots, are they going to get in? Are we going to do it correctly? Every state has, like, these different regulations and rules. So it's it's a lot of compounding factors that, um, yeah, kind of lead up to climate change and also racism at the same time. Yeah, I, um, I'm not American, um, but it's very obvious to me that it is, um, (laughs) the vote, your your current voting system is a mess and it's, um, it should be a lot safer and easier for people to vote on something so important. Um, and I think mail-in ballots is a really good way to ensure that people don't have to put themselves in danger in the middle of a pandemic um, to cast their vote. And that's definitely being threatened right now, um, particularly because it feels like this, admi- well, that feels like this current administration um, is trying to suppress votes from specific communities, those being communities of color who are most likely to take advantage of those mail-in ballots. So. Um, there's definitely an important uh, intersect there. And I, I feel like for a country that talks a lot about democracy and freedom, um, America isn't doing enough to protect that. Definitely a mess. Uh, not just, you know, the safety to get out and vote, as you as you correctly pointed out, but the entire electoral college system, which, oh man, what a disaster. Uh, it's We've been so close many times to destroying it and the old guard just holds on to this uh, just highly absurd and uh, undemocratic way of electing our president. Um, you know, the second part of the the question I wanted to ask you both was just about, um, cause I think it's also really important. Um, if you can talk about, you know, within your circles, within your, you and your family and friends in the black community, um, what do you think the awareness of it, it, for 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 the folks you do talk to uh, regularly about that intersection of climate justice and social justice? Do you think it's a majority of people? You know, I can I can tell you for sure. You know, in my, my family, um, uh, you know, uh, the, that that intersection is not. I mean, they're just still learning about social justice. Some of them, sadly, um, but for the most part, um, uh, that that's pretty well aware and and well aware of, of a climate issue, but not really the intersection of those of those. So I'm curious what that's like and uh, within your community and your friends. Um, and do you think we're making real progress on more and more people understanding how interlocked these are? I think I think steps are being made. I, I definitely think it it is being more aware even like people being more aware of like climate change and the effects of it. um, I think people are becoming more understanding about it. And yes, especially in black communities, like people have been realizing and probably are realizing more and more every day, like, Oh, these things are interrelated. So yeah, it's, it's, it's happening slowly, but surely. Yeah. I'm going to agree with Danielle on that one. Thanks for listening to another episode of Animalia. You can visit our merch store at www.iloveanimalia.com for awesome, fully sustainable wildlife gear. Use the code PODCAST, that's P-O-D-C-A-S-T, for 10% off. Also, subscribe to our weekly newsletter, where we share news and positive developments in conservation and climate work. Thank you. Till next time.